Hi everyone and welcome to Cherry Red TV. Luke Haynes is one of the most unique British songwriters of the last 20 years. His work has often pushed both lyrical and musical boundaries, but has always remained an interesting and intriguing listen. He's just about to release a new studio album called Rock and Roll Animals and joins me today to talk about his career to date. Luke, welcome. Thank you. So, I guess you kind of really started your long and winding musical journey in earnest um, when you joined the Servants in yeah. the late 1980s. Yeah. So can you kind of sort of take us up, up the path that sort of leads to that point briefly? Yeah, um, that leads to the point of the Servants. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I was, um, I'd, I'd kind of been in bands since I was sort of um, 15 or something like that. So, uh, and I'm, I moved to London when I was 17. Um, like a proper young person, you know, when young people used to leave home and stuff, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, rather than stay living at home until they're like 38. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I did the decent thing and, and, uh, and left um, uh, my parents' home at Portsmouth, um, which is, uh, you know, an interesting place, and, and moved up to uh, London uh, during, the, um, during the, the weekend of the second Brixton riots. Um, that was my kind of um, <laughs> baptism of fire. Baptism of fire was to was to move move up to um, Stockwell Road uh, on the Sunday. Uh, I think I can't remember if it was the Sunday night or it was the night before when the when they torched Brixton Police Station. So that was kind of good, um, <laughs> and that was interesting. Um, welcome to London. <laughs> yeah, welcome to London. It was and that was good because it was kind of. Um, Brixton was kind of heavy at that time, um, not like it is now, full of middle class people. You know, it was, it was good and full of rasters and good fun. Um, <laughs> uh, and then I, and I, I, I was sort of like a nice kind of uh, lower middle class boy. Um, and I, I, I was sort of um, uh, going to music college and whatnot a, a couple of days a week, not very much. Um, it didn't require much um, of my presence. I, I, I'd previously been at um, art college um, when I left school, but they asked me to leave art college because um, they said I didn't have a very good attitude right. towards, <laughs> e towards further education. Um, and I, I didn't. Um, <laughs> and I still don't. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then I, I, I answered, um, I'd had a few kind of, I had a few kind of bands or attempts at, uh, at bands and, and whatnot, um, uh, you know, in, in the mid 80s. And then, then I answered an advert in um, Sounds magazine, um, the, the sadly defunct Sounds magazine, not that sadly defunct really, um, <laughs> uh, but um, for, um, for a band called The Servants um, who, who needed a guitar player. So um, I answered that advert and, um, and I, I, I kind of got the gig um, and I, I was then in The Servants for about five years or something and um, unfortunately The Servants had sort of had had their kind of, I suppose, their day in the sun um, prior to me me joining them. <laughs> so um, I essentially joined a band that was sort of struggling quite quite a lot. I mean, even in the in the in the mid to late eighties, um, bands did sort of, you know, guitar bands um, didn't ever expect to sell any records. Yeah. Um, uh, and you know, I don't know really why you just did it because you you did it purely for kind of artistic. Reasons, you know, there was there wasn't really this idea that um, you could you could kind of uh, you know be a big pop star. That kind of all came later later on in the uh, I suppose in the nineties. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, it obviously been there, but but the I think the eighties were a really bad time for guitar bands. So we the servants kind of stumbled along for five years without any sort of um, real ambition. You know, you were kind of lucky to sell. You know, like you were looking at selling sort of you know. 2,000 records, you know. It's kind of like it is now. <laughs> it's come round again. Yeah, so everything comes, comes, comes around again. So, um, so yeah, that was, that, was the, that was the servants, yeah. I mean, you, you obviously put a lot of work in, as you say, you know, five years worth of work without kind of, as you say, getting any sort of meaningful... Well, rock and roll work, you know. Yeah. Rock and roll work's different from, like, you know... Not working like, on a like, you know, like making a road <laughs> or something like that. This is this is like you know, let's be honest. This was sort of you know, uh, you know, working out a guitar part for a song, you know, uh, once every <laughs> that's two your weeks. That's your heart and soul in terms of creativity. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Would you say that you kind of learnt 
a lot of lessons from those days that kind of helped you as your career moved into its next phase? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, it was a bit, it was, um, you know, you kind of, I, I mean, we, the first tour I did was, um, uh, was supporting a band called the Weather Prophets, um, uh, who people um, who are watching this kind of thing will, will probably be aware of. Um, uh, and the other support band on that tour was um, was the the Happy Mondays. So I was and I was like 19, 18 or nineteen. So you know that was kind of an eye opener. I bet it was. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> and you're not really, you're never really. I think when you've done when you've done you know like a proper tour like that, you're never really the same. <laughs> <laughs> you're again. <inducted. clears throat> yeah, you're kind of you you're, you're kind of either you're either going to sort of do that forever, uh, or you're kind of kind of gonna go no way I'm getting out of this you know um, so yeah it was kind of like a war or something you know and you were quite happy to carry on <laughs> in yeah. the trenches absolutely yeah 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 and it was kind of like you know it was you know if we're, if we're gonna use that this sort of like that that's sort of like rather kind of crap and inappropriate metaphor that I've <laughs> instigated um, that obviously obviously I don't really believe that rock and roll is like a war but yeah I was it was very much in the trenches yeah of rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the in the early nineties, you formed the Auteurs. Mm. Was was there a kind of a vision for for what you wanted that band to be? Early oh on? yeah, yeah. I mean, it was every. It was sort of like for the first Auteurs album, I put kind of every idea that I'd had and I'd streamlined over the years. Uh, in the Servants, I wasn't <clears throat> I wasn't song, the songwriter. Um, so I would, you know, I'd, I'd written s songs before the servants. And I'd tried stuff out, but I was never really happy with it. So when when the servants kind of hit the hit the dust, hit the skids or whatever, um, or just you know, we just stopped because there was nowhere to nowhere to go. Really, no one wanted us, um, and uh, you know, even though we even though what we were doing was good, it was very um, very out of time um, with everything else. Um, so it couldn't really, it could, it could either exist just as, as pure art, which it did um, for a bit, or it could just, um, you know, we could just, you know, turn the lights out on it. So we sort of turned the lights out on it. And then it, it left me with nowhere, nowhere to go but to kind of, to actually, you know, um, step up and write my own songs. So I just, I sort of taught myself how to write songs, really, um, and streamlined everything I thought about what rock and roll was into what became the sort of like the first auteurs album. And when when you eventually got signed by Hut, did mm. that did that feel like a bit of a vindication of, of you know the years of that kind of trying hugely, to get to that point? I don't know if it felt vindication is maybe the wrong word, um, but it felt like um, it was a huge surprise to me because like, like I said before, you know, you've got to remember that that mid eighties thing that I was from was kind of it was kind of art for art's sake, and it was there was wasn't a huge amount of ambition to be. Very few bands kind of got signed to major labels, and it suddenly it suddenly kind of changed in the um, in the early nineties when when major labels started to sign guitar bands again. Um, so I was just I was couldn't believe it that there was actually a we were signed. I don't know after about our fifth or sixth gig, something like that, and there was actually a kind of um, you know, there was there there was kind of labels chasing us. You know, it was just, you know, I think we got an NME review, and this is the days when the music press held some kind of sway. You know, uh, it was you know you, you were kind of, you know, it, it live and die by the sword of of the NME and the Melody Maker in those days. Yeah. And um, if they gave you a good review, you know, and You're we got a great way. review, and and suddenly I had record companies phoning me up. These, these are record companies that previously actually sent me back tapes, <laughs> who were then telling me. East West, um, sent, I sent, for some reason, I bombarded East, a guy, one guy at um, East West Records um, with about 26 demo tapes, just because I thought, well, you know, rather than give him one, I'm just going to shower him <laughs> so that he knows. Grind him down. Yeah, yeah, grind him down, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know, this, this, way, the, this guy will know that I am a force of nature. Um, and so I, I sent him that 26 tapes, and two days later I got a call from the secretary saying, can we have the address, the address, your address please, we'd like to send you your tapes back. 
<laughs> and then I think a week later, this review appeared in the NME, and then boom, East West. From the, can you send us a demo? Tape? <laughs> <laughs> can you send us back those twenty six tapes? Yeah, yeah, amazing. So yeah, um, and we got so we got signed um, very quick. I mean, it took a long time. I think you know uh, this was kind of this this went on from about May till about the end of that year, which was nineteen ninety two. And it took, yeah, it took us that long to get signed, but we were in the process of, sort of sifting through these record deals. I don't like that one. It was kind of like, it was, you know, it was sort of like proper old school music business stuff of kind of pick, pick your record deal, which one would you like? You know, so yeah. And, and when the album <coughs> came out, New Wave, mm. uh, it reached the top 30 in the UK? It did, yeah. Um, nominated for a Mercury Music Prize that was as well? Bit, that was a bit later on, yeah, yeah. I mean, looking back, are you kind of proud of that as your first commercially oh, yeah, released a, body of work? Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, and I thought, you know, there's a, things changed later on in the 90s when it became about, you know, selling, you know, a million records. Um, but I couldn't, you know, again, it harks back to where I was from, this idea of, you know, you put out records in the 80s and you sold a couple of thousand. I couldn't believe it that we, this record I'd made was, was in the top 30. It was nuts, you know, it, just, it, was, it was completely like, what? Because <laughs> I thought I was going to end up releasing it, you know, when I, when I wrote the songs, I thought I was going to end up releasing it, you know, on, you know, probably like, you know, just, you know, do my own label or something. Because I didn't think that anyone would, would, um, would want to do this stuff. Because it was kind of out of, it was kind of out of whack with what was going on around uh, at the time. Um, and, you know, and w w you know, when I was giving the demos out, um, to sort of, you know, to promoters and stuff, they would, you know, they'd, they'd laugh, you know, at it. They would openly laugh at, the, at this stuff and sort of like, you know, are you kidding? You More know. fooling. Yeah, well, kind <laughs> of, you know, and band, you know, we, when we were kind of, you know, on the few gigs we did, which was, you know, before we had any reviews, we were kind of, we would support these kind of, um, you know, grungy kind of, what became, kind of, I suppose, was called grunge or what became grunge, whatever. Um, these sort of grungy kind of bands who would just laugh at me because I was they, in a nice kind of way because no one's like no one's really that confrontational in rock and roll you know people are generally quite nice um, you know uh, they they'd sort of laugh you know what do you, you know they they thought I was like some you know what's what's this kind of I took a showgirl for my bride stuff they said, well, you're, <laughs> what are you some like Elizabethan guy because <laughs> they were all kind of like just churning this sort of like Seattle kind of stuff out yeah. so it was you know. That's kind of where we were in 19, 1992. Um, but I guess, <clears throat> I mean, reasonably soon after that, probably within the next year, 18 months, that kind of started to change. And I think that was kind of the beginnings of what eventually became called the Britpop movement. Um, yeah, it changed. Um, well, it, cha it changed towards the end of 1993. Um, I mean, Sway. We were kind of we were kind of aligned with Suede, um, although we were very different. Um, you know, Suede were kind of um, this sort of uh, you know this kind of sexual kind of um, full-on rock and roll, um, violent kind of animal kind of thing. And the auteurs were kind of asexual, sarcastic, and erratic. <laughs> um, so we were very different, but um, you know something was already happening with you know I mean we did that with the suede the early suede tour one of the, one of the early suede tours, and it was like it was it was like kind of like a teenage rampage. It was I mean you know if you weren't there you wouldn't have believed it, but it was it was you know the kids were kind of coming to these gigs just they were just coming from everywhere the suburbs everywhere, uh, and they were going nuts. For this band, you know, I'd never seen anything like it. Kids were just like throwing themselves. You know, the only thing that, that kind of compares, I suppose, was that I saw the Smiths kind of early on, around about their sort of like, I don't know, fifth or sixth gig or something like that on one of their, I think probably their first tour. And it was kind of, you know, it was kind of similar um, to that, that they kind of, you know, there was there was something happening and it yeah. wasn't it wasn't forced by the music press. It was just, it was just a really good band. Um, who were fantastic live, um, just sort of like, you know, blow, blowing the kids' minds, you know. But did you, I, I think later on you, you've been fairly open about the fact that 
you kind of didn't enjoy that association with with that Brit pop scene as it as it kind of developed and became something that was. Well, I don't think I don't think, I don't think Suede or the auteurs had anything to do with Brit pop really. Um, you know, so I mean, we were, we were both highly, you know, I mean, there wasn't any kind of camaraderie between us and them. Um, you know, they were all they were all right as people, but um, still are. Um, but um, you know, they were they were very they were very much in the zone of doing their own. Thing. That's, and that's where you are if you're if you're kind of like a happening band. You're kind of in in the zone if you know what you're doing is good. I was kind of in my zone, so there wasn't this kind of like let's all you know we are we are some kind of scene going on here. So that was kind of like. That was just like nonsense. Um, um, you know, there was a similarity that we both kind of sounded English. That was it. Um, yeah. And w the references, if any, if there were, were probably things like you know, were kind of Bowie and um, the Kinks and sort of T Rex. More, more sort of. My end was more sort of um, the Kinks and, and T Rex certainly early on. Um, but there was an element of Bowie in there, and you've also got to remember that in the early '90s, no one gave a toss about Bowie. Yeah. You know the, the you know the um, the enemy were in you know I think in 1990 when he did that tour of the hits album, the enemy were openly mocking Bowie and doing that thing about you know getting that petition to get to you know get him to play the Laughing Gnome. I mean you can imagine that happening now. Yeah. You know, the enemy would do nothing but fawn at David Bowie. Now, but in the early '90s, he was kind of like you know he was a laughing stock. So we were kind of drawing on that. On his on his stuff, and that, no one was really taking that at that point. Obviously, you know, he'd been a massive influence anyway throughout the years, but that was just a point when people weren't kind of looking towards that kind of stuff. So that was the, I suppose, the similarity. And then uh, you know, by the end of maybe by the end of 1993, other bands were kind of coming along, and the, there was, you know, the music press were kind of trying to make something out of this. Thing I think the, they, the Select magazine did that Union Jack. That's right. Yeah. Cover that um, that you know I was kind of like I was sort of uh, appalled when I saw that. I couldn't believe I didn't want to be associated with that. You know. So the the next album now I'm a, now I'm a cowboy. Yeah. That was that was your most commercially successful. I think that made top yeah. twenty in the UK. Yeah, it did. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you think that was kind of also musically the best work that the brand produced? Nah, it's good. It's pretty good. I mean, at the time I didn't like it much. Um, but I think it stands up. You know, it's kind of like a professional album. <laughs> I've, I've, I've only made a couple of like, professional. Maybe that's the only one I think that might be the. It's kind of a professional album. It had, you know, um, you know, it had great kind of. If you listen to it, it's like the drums are kind of produced and stuff. You can there's like a drum sound that has like reverb and things like that. And it was it was kind of. You know, we did. I think we remixed it all. You know, to make it better, right? And those kind of things. And there was a lot of kind of. There was a lot of fretting about it. You know, and all that kind of stuff. And it was sort of done in. You know, we had to go in the best studios. All that kind of. You know, nonsense. And the first album. You know, we just like we did it before we had a record deal. We. You know, we had a manager um, who just who just uh, who just. I, you know, I think he stumped up about six grand or something like that, <laughs> which at the time was kind of quite a lot of money, but it, it was also quite cheap to make an album in those days. Because remember, everyone was making albums in studios then. No one makes albums in studios anymore. Um, and so the second album, I think, you know, probably cost about seventy-five thousand quid or something. <laughs> yeah, like Very just, different experience. <coughs> yeah, yeah, and they were kind of always the record company was sort of uh, you know trying to trying to kind of always suggest producers and stuff like that. Uh, you know, David, you should get David Lynch <laughs> to produce. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Could have been good, I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think you're kind of someone that's always sort of been able to stand apart a little bit from the celebrity side of being in a band, this kind of show busy side. I suppose. Was, was, that, was that kind of, you know, you're obviously gaining in popularity around that time, you were getting more fans. Was, was there any elements of that that you felt a little bit uncomfortable with? Oh yeah, I thought all, I thought all that was. I mean, I'm not I'm not sort of suited towards um, that kind of that kind of stuff. I like to, you know, if you want to be, you know, if you want to be like a kind of proper proper pop star, you have to you have to sort of do do the kind of, you have to play the game quite a lot. Uh, and I'm not really that. I just I couldn't really I didn't I wasn't into that kind of thing. I mean, it was it was all kind of. The stuff I was into and the way I liked was was kind of highly individual, um, and uh, was was you know there's n there's no room for kind of like individuality really if you want to be a pop star. I mean it, you have to be kind of quite a conformist I think to be a to be a proper pop star. To be star. a successful. To pop be a proper star. pop star. Yeah yeah. 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 Um, and I was never going to be 
I'm never going to do anything like that. I was, that was just not. It wasn't. It was never going to happen. You know, no one would have. No one, quite rightly, no one would. would you know, would have me to be. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, you know, a, a, a proper pop star. It'd be a terrible idea. And I, I certainly couldn't lead any kind of scene or movement. I'd just like get everyone to, you know, follow me. You know, we'll go to the edge of the cliff, you know, push them <laughs> over and spit on the body. That's, <laughs> that's the way I saw it. <laughs> so moving forward to 96, you released mm. a, a solo album under the name of Bader Meinhof. Yeah. Which is um, a reference to the German militant faction. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, the, the album itself and its content was very much <clears> based <throat> on the group and their actions mm. and, and your interpretation of it. Yeah. Was there kind of any sort of negative reaction f from people from covering what was a fairly controversial subject? And yeah. What, and what kind of inspired you to, to come out with that? Well, the, the, re what I, what I, the reason I, I did it was because I, I just got interested in reading about, you know, when you, when you kind of... Um, you know, when you when we'd been touring a lot and stuff like that, and then I'd, um, uh, you know, you, if you spend a lot of time reading, you kind of you look, you're always looking for for things to to interest you. So I'd, I'd kind of got interested in in the Bader Meinhof group, the Red Army faction. So I sort of you know, and this is this is obviously kind of before the internet, so you couldn't just um, Google stuff. There wasn't that much stuff, so you had to seek out um, these kind of rare books and whatnot. Um, and so I'd kind of been reading up about all this stuff and I just found it really interesting. Um, I mean I, was, I wasn't kind of uh, pro uh, what they were doing, I thought they were idiots but it was kind of, in, it was just it was just fascinating stuff but at the same time I kind of, I was kind of listening to music I hadn't been into before, kind of like I was getting into sort of um, Funkadelic and Lee Perry and stuff like that. So the, the two things kind of came together to, to perform, to sort of uh, uh, and became this sort of, um, you know, this kind of weird kind of art concept album about, you know, I thought, well, I'll, I'll just combine my two interests, which are kind of sort of mutated funk with terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just, I'll just sort of like weld them together into this sort of, this album. And it, I mean, I could have been really, uh, the thing is, I realise now that I could have been singing about anything. You know, if I'd taken, if I'd taken an interest in sort of rowing, or something like that. I would have still kind of um, <laughs> would have had a rowing. Yeah, album. but it would have been like to kind of like with you know mutated funk <laughs> rowing album. You know, and that's what that's kind of what art is. You just you just make stuff. You know, it's just like oh, just make something today, see what you know. Let's just make that. Yeah, there it is. You know, and that's kind of what it was. It didn't go down that well at the time. It, this is also the height height of what sort of um, became became Britpop. Um, so so the, you know the music press were pretty confused by this guy <laughs> sort of doing f funk music about German terrorists. Um, uh, you know, I think the NME. Yeah, I, I think I, I think the press release. I got. I, I sort of tore a page out of this this book that was called the Anarchist Cookbook, which you couldn't get at the time. It was still banned in this country because <laughs> it was all. I mean, it was pretty. So it was pretty serious stuff, but it sort of also wasn't. Seriously, it was all kind of like how to make sort of like you know like a nail bomb in your basement and stuff. It was it was kind of written um, in the it was an American book and it was written in the kind of late sixties, early seventies um, when all these kind of groups like the Weather Underground were around. It was sort of like how to sort of like <laughs> overthrow his, overthrow the state, you know, <laughs> in your basement. <laughs> and it was all kind of like if you tried this stuff, you'd blow yourself up. Obviously, yeah. it was all kind of like. You know, it was terrible. So I, I ripped this page out and photocopied it, which was, I think, which was how to, how to make a nail bomb. And I sent it to the NME <laughs> with, a, with the single. And like, the review was about how kind of like, about how kind of irresponsible I was. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it was a bit irresponsible, but then it was, you know, it really was only just a record, you know. So, you know, it was a bit hysterical, but yeah, God bless. God love them. You know, the NME had uh, always watching the morals of the nation. But, I mean, has that, has that been important to you, though, <clears throat> as a songwriter, to kind of have that freedom <clears throat> to go down different sort of musical paths? Well, to I not thought that's, be what, kind of that's kind of what rock and roll one. is. That's what, always what I thought it was. You know, if you want to go and if you want to be a rock and, proper rock and roller, you know, it's not about kind of being a conformist and sort of like, you know, well, I'm going to do this and then, you know, if I play it right, you know, uh, you know, this time next year I'll be on the main stage at Glastonbury. 
It's not that. It's not. It shouldn't be about that. It should be about well. The reason I do this is because I like doing my own thing. You know, I like making things. You know, if I've got an idea to do, you know, a concept album about rowing or a concept album about, you know, uh, about pole vaulting, that's what I'll do. You know, it's not about you know. Uh, you know, well, you know. Hopefully, my, you know, my, my pole vaulting concept album should get me on the, you know, the main <laughs> stage of Glastonbury. It's not about that. It's not, nothing to do with that. It's about sort of, you know, it's, a, it's genuinely about freedom of expression. And then it, it, into the 90s, you, you formed Black Box Recorder with John Moore and yeah. Sarah Nixie. Mm. Was that kind of a conscious attempt to, to do something different, to move <clears> on <throat> from the auteurs? Um... I, it was probably a subconscious attempt, um, <clears throat> but it just happened because John, John and I knew each other, um, and it wasn't it wasn't my group or anything. It was very much a collaboration. Uh, that that group it was a good group, um, uh, and we you know we just all knew each other, um, and so it, it you know we got on. So it, and John and I found we could write songs together, and I'd never really written songs with anyone before, and I don't think, don't think he had, and the songs just sort of worked. Um, and we didn't, he, you know, we were both, you know, we were both kind of in our, I was in my early 30s, John was much older. <laughs> <laughs> you won't work, then, we yeah, say. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we, so we had a bit of, um, you know, we had a, we were a bit kind of wiseacre by that, that time, you know, and we'd been, John had sort of um, been around the track a few times, he'd been in the Mary chain and, yeah. uh, and he'd done his own thing. And Sarah, but Sarah was kind of young, so we, we also kind of thought we were these sort of like, um, you know, these sort of, uh, you know, empresarios or something like that, you know. <laughs> but Sarah was far too smart for that, you know. <laughs> she, she wouldn't have any of our nonsense. So, so it became, it was good, it was a collaboration and everyone kind of got to do their thing and it worked. And again, it was kind of, you, you, took, you took sort of the sound that you kind of been previously known for and went <clears> off <throat> kind of down a different path, I mean, of, you know, at, at the obvious end, Sarah was, was the vocalist on yeah. quite a lot of the tracks. You see, I never think about those sort of things. Um, I suppose that's, you know, you... I never think that, you know, that some... That, you know, that uh, I need to do something and it should always follow, you know, a line from the last thing or something. I think it should be... My view is that I can kind of do anything I want. I mean, what's the... Who's there to, you know, to say I shouldn't? I kind of don't get it, that, that idea of... Um, you know, well, you know, that's... Uh, we had this thing, the weird thing was, with the auteurs was that we were... As the, as the kind of what, what became Britpop was happening in, in uh, nine, back to 1993, um, uh, we were kind of... We got quite big in France. Um, and it was quite good fun, because you could go over... We spent quite a lot of time playing in France. You'd go over to France and be quite big. You know, um, and people would kind of like, you know, swallow all my kind of horse shit, you know. <laughs> where, you know, and then... then um, <laughs> You know, here we were just like, you know, just some sort of like, you know, an, a group, you know, that were in the NME or whatnot, and no, no one was going to like, you know, like stop you on the street. But France was kind of a big deal. But the weird thing was the time the second album came out in France, it, it was perceived to be so different from the first album that it was kind of like, we don't like this group anymore. <laughs> you were so, cast aside. Yeah, very much. Yeah, yeah. Fickle, the fickle French. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you also had your biggest. A hit single, I think, with Black Box Recorder. Oh which yeah, was, uh, well, it was the an actual hit single. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I think you're also on <clears> record as <throat> saying that there were there were quite a lot of problems with the record company around that time. Did, did <laughs> that kind of derail you a little bit as a band, or in terms of I the success mm, that you could have had? There were well, you know, the thing the thing the problem was um, no, I don't think it did really. Um, we wrote we wrote the hit, the hit single the hit single. Um, it was a conscious effort to have a hit single. Okay. So we listened to the radio and uh, how you did these things. We didn't really know. We also John and I kind of and this is genuine. We sort of felt a bit guilty because we pulled Sarah out of the world of real work <laughs> to be in our band and we did the first album which was great but it didn't really sell a huge amount. So. Um, we thought, you know, we owe this, you know, this. And Sarah was kind of in her mid twenties at the time, and we, we thought we've got to, we've got to sort of, you know, pull something out of the bag and and get, give her a reason to be doing this and give her a proper hit single. So we did that, um, and it was sort of like it was, 
she she sort of inspired that. She okay. kind of made that happen. It was to, we it was because otherwise it, you know we didn't think we would been good enough for her really because um, she's a great singer and a great front person and a great musician. So we we didn't we didn't think we'd really you know we thought we were we were underselling her a bit. So we did we pulled that one out of the bag. Um, but then there were yeah there were problems because the record company basically went went bust. Um, Midway through, and we were. It's sort of, it, you know, the the single probably would have got gone higher. I think it made the top twenty, but there were there were there were problems with manufacturing and all that kind of stuff. So they were the record company were kind of going bust. Then they pulled it out from the bag, and they didn't go bust, and everything was okay again. Then we recorded the next album for that record company, and then they did go bust, and the record the record then sat in the receiver's office, which is where you know when your when your business goes. Um, goes you know up against the wall uh goes to the wall you know you uh everything is seized so basically our album sat in in the receiver's office for like i don't know 18 months um we couldn't do anything about it um so that so we'd record an album that was kind of meant to be out <laughs> two years earlier than it was so yeah that's kind of what that's kind of what happened so and we didn't really we just kind of i think we just lost the energy after that point to do that anymore so we kind of just stopped. And, and kind of <clears> af <throat> after that point, you started your, essentially your sort of solo career, you started releasing yeah. albums under your own name. Yeah, um, yeah. And that, that's, I think, I think I'm right in saying it's about eight albums, uh, including two film soundtracks in the last 11 years eight, or so. I think it's one, fil one film soundtrack. Um, I don't know how many, actually I don't know. Has, th has that <laughs> been kind of a different experience, kind of writing, recording, releasing under your own oh, name yeah, rather I mean, than as part of a band? Yeah, I mean, now, yeah, now you've got, I've got to do that. I mean, uh, you know, um, you know, I'm 45 years old, and you can't be in a band when you're 45. It's ridiculous, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, what, what am I, what am I going to do? Like hide behind, you know, start the name of some band? Yeah, I formed a band. You know, we're called the, you know, the Amazing Spoons. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know, and we're all 45, you know, get fucked, you know, that's not going to, that's never going to happen. So yeah, but I have no problem in kind of being, being myself and, uh, or a version of myself, whatever, um, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and putting out, and putting out records. That's what, that's the way it has to be. I've got, I've got no truck with, you know, unless, unless the band's been kind of going for, you know, for a hundred years, I kind of like those groups that kind of, you know, that keep like Hawkwind are still going, and they're all like seventy-eight, and all the four are still going, going, and they're like, you know, a, ver a version of the four. I like that kind of thing, and I don't, I don't think there's any embarrassment in that. It's just like, you know, you know, reforming the old band or, or you know, starting a new band at my age, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess your your kind of lyrical themes and <clears> concepts <throat> across this body of solo work have been incredibly varied. I mm. mean, things from the afterlife to the Yorkshire Ripper murders, yeah. um, ageing rock stars to mm. life in the home counties. I mean, mm. you've kind of really run the gamut of, of, of all areas of life. Mm. I mean, wh where do you from, kind a, of, from A to B and back in? Indeed, yeah. <laughs> where, do you, where do you kind of draw your inspirations from when, you, when you're coming up with new songs? Oh, I have no idea. I just follow it. I, I, now, now I just follow a, a line of thought. Um, to its to its natural conclusion, which which tends to be a concept album, so just have an idea and make it into, and it can be the, it can be the smallest or the, 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 the strangest idea, and you can just see what I think the point is to kind of create something uh, unexpected out of that, and out of that then comes something that's interesting, um, and then if it's interesting, there might be it might you might find out it's about other things as well. Um, you know, uh, I mean, the last the last solo album I did was about was about wrestling, um, but it was kind of about other things as well. It's kind of um, you know, I realised afterwards it was kind of about my dad who was ill, who's still very ill um, at the time, uh, uh, and and it was kind of about that as well. Um, and you just realise it's you're writing about other things as well. So elements of yourself kind of find their way into those songs somewhere yeah, even, sometimes. If, even if you yeah. start off from I mean, something that isn't necessarily that personal yeah not always you know sometimes it can be a completely it can be a completely uh you know fictitious scenario you know it doesn't have to be i don't think i don't think songs have to be autobiographical i don't think you know i don't think 
art or whatever has to be about you know this is you know about um you know uh, it doesn't have to it, it, it can be complete artifice i have no problem with that at all it doesn't have to be about you know you know i cut my wrists and i bleed for you it doesn't have to be about any of that crap you know it can be about anything and I guess like. that kind of, in a way, <clears throat> harks back to what you said were your early influences, bands like the Kinks, who kind of wrote a lot of that sort of observational type thing, creating characters, etc. I suppose. I mean, I haven't, I mean, I, I, you know, I haven't listened to the Kinks for years and years. I mean, I got, I, I got a bit put off the Kinks when they were the sort of like the kind of um, the band to sort of name drop when it was, you know, about the rate, the uh, about the kind of Brit pop times. Um, but you know, I mean, you know, the, the Kings are obviously a great band, but um, I haven't listened to them for a long time. But whether there's anything still coming through that ilk, I don't know. So reviewers often seem to interpret from your work that you're kind of this sharp-tongued, mm. acerbic, caustic, perhaps even grumpy kind of guy. Mm. Have, have they got you all wrong? Uh, some, yeah, sometimes. I think. I mean. Um, I mean, I made a, you know, there was, I think, I think I got that reputation through the kind of, in the, in the, in the Britpop years when I was kind of quite anti all that stuff. And I was, I was always, you know, I was fairly forthright in, in what I, you know, in my opinions and other bands. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but that was kind of, that, that was kind of about my contemporaries at the time. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be like that now about, certainly I wouldn't, I wouldn't start getting down on, on, on some group that, you know, of, of, uh, 20 year olds because it'd be it would kind of be that would really be like like you know bullying or something like that you know I, I think every I think every kind of 20 year old has has got the right to kind of go out there and be a chancer with a guitar you know it's just a shame there's no music industry left for them to go and plunder you know um but Still that's some of us there. <laughs> yeah yeah well it's the yes yeah yeah but there's um you know but that's a, that's a thing of that's a thing of age really I mean I, you know you know I, I would only ever be um Rude about my peers. <laughs> <laughs> Even then, I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm not that. I don't really have any now, so I, I'm just, I just, I'm just completely out on my own, which is where I like to be. I don't care what other people are doing, you know. Leave them to it. And, and as we were saying before, you don't, you don't keep count. But in my research, I think I've got 18 albums that you've been involved with in, in about a 20 year Sounds period. About right, yeah. Which is, you know. The, the vast majority of which have probably contained songs written by you, or, or at least co-written by you. Yeah, pretty much, um, yeah. I mean, that's incredibly prolific by, by any standards, really. I don't know. I think it's, that's kind of what you should do, though. If, you, if you're kind of in a, you know, if you're in rock and roll, you're there, you're there to kind of, that's what you do. You, you, you know, you make records, you write songs. I mean, you, you're not, you know, what else are you going to do? You know, you <laughs> you're sit not, there you're not and into write, these bands that take... Look five at, years to make a record. <laughs> I don't understand. I think if it take if it takes five years and it's the record's probably probably quite bad. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't. I kind of don't get that. You know, it's like if you're a proper writer. You know, like you know, like something you know, feel like Philip Roth or someone like that. You know, you knock out a novel. You know, like every 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 nine months or whatnot. You know, it's what you do if you're an artist. You're supposed to, you know, do art. You're not meant to sort of just sit there and think about being arty. You actually do do the art. That's what you do. You know. And would you say that, <clears throat> that songwriting comes quite naturally to you? You're not someone that kind of sits there and has big periods of writer's yeah. block or something like that. Nah, just uh, I've never really a writer's block. No, you just, just I just like I, said, I just I just write now. You know. I mean, whether there's any quality control, who knows? Probably not. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't sort of matter. You know, because it's sort of. Um, you know, it's all it's all it's all self-expression, and all that kind of self-expression is a good thing. And I guess that that kind of rate of, of albums it is kind of made even more remarkable by the fact that you've also written two books in that yeah. time as well. What what kind of was the drive behind adding author to your many talents? I just well, I did a sh I did a show in Edinburgh. Um, that was kind of like it was me just I, I was it, I say a show it was kind of it was me that makes me sound like I I'm, you know had some sort of like Johnny Vegas comedy show <laughs> or I'm sort of like throwing myself around a room maybe and next up, year yeah maybe yeah um, um, no I did I did a sort of like a, a, a three night kind of stand in Edinburgh where where I sort of did I involved some sort of monologue as it were of me sort of talking about stuff um, and there were kind of some publishing people turned up and they said, oh, you should, you know, have you thought about writing a book? I said, no, I haven't. Um, 
Uh, and they, they were kind of like, well, you know, if ever you do, you know, send it to us. So um, I sort of like prompt, I sort of like said, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And they probably forgot and didn't bother. <laughs> then, I, then I sort of like, uh, I had an album out at the time, Got Off My Rock at the Art School Bop. And it was kind of a, that was a difficult time because I was just, um, for, for many reasons, um, you know, it, I was having a tough time in actually selling records at that point and doing anything. Um, people were kind of, the album came out and it kind of got, it was, it was all right, but it was kind of like, oh, he's just made another record. No one was that interested. You get those points, you know, if you've been around a long time. However good the record is, you, is there's, there's going to be an element of like, that's just another record. So it was a weird, so I thought, ah, oh, you know, sod this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down and, and do this book thing. Um, so I wrote a few chapters of, of what became Bad Vibes and I sent it off to a uh, publisher and uh, they liked it. And I just, I just wrote the book in, I don't know, a few months. Um, just sat down every day and wrote, did it. I thought I'd just do this for a bit. And they were essentially memoirs of a, of a type? Yeah. Of, of kind of those years that you spent? Yeah. In the auteurs and, and yeah, the, 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 yeah, the first one was kind of the 90s um, and then the second one was called Post Everything Outside of Rock and Roll was kind of um, black box recorder to a bit, little bit of the early solo stuff. Um, so let's talk about the new album. Yeah. Number 19 by my count. Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, rock and Roll Animals, yeah. which is due out later this year. Yeah. It seems to be, you know, kind of very much following on <clears throat> from what you've done in the past, a, a concept work. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how it came together? Yeah, I mean, this is probably more, this is kind of as conceptual, I suppose, as the, um, the last two, which were the, 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 the one was the North Sea Scrolls, which was a kind of collaboration with um, Cahill um, the, uh, uh from Micro Disney, Fatima Mansions, um, which was a sort of like a, a kind of, imagined history of the of um of the world you know um and then the one before that was the wrestling uh nine and a half psychedelic meditations on british wrestling um and this one it follows i suppose in that in that uh that idea it's a kind of it's a psychedelic psychedelic story um it's about um a fox called jimmy percy a cat called Gene Vincent and a badger called Nick Lowe. And they all live in Walton on Thames, which is where I was born. Right. Uh, and it's about their it's about their times and uh, there's a there's a kind of they have a nemesis which is called the Angel of the North. Uh, that that uh, that stands for kind of unrighteousness. Right. Uh, they very much stand for righteousness. So it's a kind of it's like a story for grown ups and children. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's sort of, there, there are many, it's kind of many layers to it, but I, it kind of came about because um, uh, I'd sort of, I'd become kind of fascinated with Wal Walton on Thames where I was born. Um, and I knew that, I knew that um, Nick Lowe was from there. Um, and I knew that obviously that Jimmy Percy, uh, who was from Hersham, but he, he, he wrote, um, most of Sham 69's concept album, That's Life, in Walton, uh, on Thames. And what I found out was that Gene Vincent, when he, uh, when he toured the UK in 1969, um, he actually stayed in Walton on Thames. Okay. Uh, which would, and which, and it, would have, it was a few roads in a bed set, a few roads from where I was living at the time as a two year old, which sort of like, that sparked, that sparked the whole thing off I must in my admit, head. I did wonder. How where Gene... you kind of got those three people? Yeah, from. They, they all, they all, they all, yeah, they all, they all converge on on Walton on Thames, which becomes Magic Town uh, in this in this album. And I, I mean, it's definitely got elements, as you say, of like that sort of childlike storytelling, almost, and yeah. particularly in the kind of spoken word passages. Yeah, I got Julia Davis to do um, okay. the spoken word bits. Um, she's a pal of mine, so I got her to do. I, I, I did. Them, I recorded them originally. And then I thought, well, I, I can hear another voice on this. And it suddenly occurred to me, it was her voice. So I asked her really nice, I, I didn't think she'd do it for one minute. And she said, yeah, she'd love to do it. So it's great. Just getting her in. <laughs> so it adds a sort of kind of, um, a kind of, I don't know, a slight, uh, it makes it slightly sinister in a weird way, but kind of still like a storybook. Um, 
which is the idea. It reminded me a little bit with kind of the spoken word passages of, of Ogden's Not Gone Flake, the Small Faces album. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's, yeah that, that's kind of like half a concept album, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, are the, are the kind of concept albums that have inspired you in any way from the past? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of like... Uh, I like the idea of you, of you, you know, take an idea and you go with it. I mean, some of my favourite... Um, I mean, I've spoken about it a lot, but Robert Calvert um, from Hawkwind made uh, quite a few concept albums. Um, Captain Lockheed um, is his, probably his best known, which is a concept album about um, uh, how the American... A true, a true story about how the American military sold, um, sold the Luftwaffe um, uh, rubbish uh, rubbish fighters <laughs> after the war um, in, a, in a bid to sort of uh, in a bid to sort of like further dismantle the German <laughs> armed forces and it's about it's about the sort of the tragedy of this situation that German pilots were going up and, the, and they were you know they were known as the widow makers these these uh, and so Calvert um, a man who didn't do things by halves um, did a did a concept album about it and it's it's got spoken word things on it with Viv Stanchel. Um, okay. it's got, I think it's got, it's got an amazing cast. It's got um, Viv Stanchel, uh, Eno's on it, um, uh, Arthur, Arthur Brown is on it, uh, Nico was even on it um, at one point, it's just, it, and Lemmy's on it, okay. uh, and most of Hawkwind right. as well. And uh, Calvert also did an album called um, uh, uh, Lucky, what was it, Lucky Leaf and the, and, the, and the Long Ships, which is about what would have happened if the Vikings had, um, had, had uh, invaded America. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you find do you find that do you find the kind of concept type things easier to write in a way that once you've got that idea formed the songs kind of flow naturally around it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's just about making. I just I just think the kind of the, you know the rock and roll, the possibilities with rock and roll are kind of never really fulfilled. It can be many. It can be many things. It doesn't just have to be. You know, um, a two-minute single or whatever. You know, it, it can be, and that's great. But um, it can be many other things. I never kind of got the idea of, of why why people thought that you know the, you know that rock operas were kind of pompous and things. So, you know, maybe they are. Course, they might be pompous, but who cares? Isn't that the point? Yeah. You know, rock and roll is meant to be ludicrous. You know, there's always that. You know, there's that. There's, there's that. You know, I mean, Ray Manzarek died a couple of days ago, and. Uh, you know, there was always very much, you know, the, the line that, you know, the Doors were kind of like this sort of terrible band and this, this, this idea that, you know, this was the kind of the hipster thinking of, um, you know, that seems to have cropped up, you know, and this Jim Morrison, this Lizard King idea, what a, you know, ridiculous, pompous, great oaf. And it's like, no way, you know, that's fantastic, you know. A man in leather trousers proclaiming himself to be the Lizard King, that's what I fucking want. You know. It seems to be something that is that is missing a little bit yeah. from today's music scene. Well, is, is, is ir kind of irony has, d has has done for a lot of rock and roll. You see, you know, uh, you know, you can only be the Lizard King now, and, and then you, and you know, but you'd have to do it. You'd have to do it with a kind of, you know, I'm not really <laughs> <laughs> a knowing wink. Yeah, I'm the Lizard King. I'm not really. You know, I'm, I'm the Lizard King. <laughs> you know, uh, and it just wouldn't it wouldn't work. You know, and uh, so you know. So uh, you know, I like to think that my, I like to think that my stuff is sort of um, it, it bypasses the irony thing because it's about the imagination that you can do anything with imagination. So you've been you've been kind of releasing material now for for twenty years. Mm. Are any kind of unfulfilled ambitions or directions that you would like to explore going forward? Um, I think in the next in the next five years, I'd like to make a lot more. Um, records and really push it as to what these records are you know uh, you know I've got you know I've got five years till I'm 50 um, you know I'm saying let's have some fun with it let's have some fun with the form you know there's 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 no reason to be serious about it you know I'm serious about what I do but there's no reason to be kind of like you know be uptight yeah. about it and can you ever envisage a time when sort of songwriting and making albums won't be part of your life? We'll be we'll be sitting here in 10, 15 years time talking about album number 30 or maybe more. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. Um, well, no, I think if you're an artist, you do, you like I said before, you make art, you make stuff. You don't just stop, you know. You know, most, you know, 
artists just keep going, you know, you know, Matisse, you know, painted, uh, you know, he was still painting when he was in a wheelchair and he could barely, you know, he could barely do anything, you know, his last paintings are, there's pictures of him, you know, in, in you know, just sort of like, uh, you know, a very old man, um, you know, barely capable of doing anything, but he could still manage to, to, to paint, you know. I'm not comparing myself to Matisse, I don't even like Matisse that much, <laughs> but it's an example of, you know, of the, you, you go, you know, you continue. That creative urge is, is yeah. always a part of your life. Yeah. Otherwise such. you're not, you know, you, you, you're something else, you know. Well, thanks very much for joining us today. It's been, it's been really you. interesting talking about your career and, and we wish you the very best with the new album, Rock and Roll Animals. Thank you. And join us soon for more Cherry Red TV. This is the title track from the Rock and Roll Animals album. It's called Rock and Roll Animals on Cherry Red Records. The town clock it strikes at midnight. Magic land is Walton on Thames. The good folks sit by the fireside, telling stories through the flames about the river bank. It's an enchanted land. Where the animals chew the fat The rock and roll animals, the rock and roll animals Nick the badger, Jean the cat There's a cutthroat in the hedgerow A pirate cutthroat, it's Jimmy the fox He's a sly one, runs with a bad mob From Hersham Village, he's a punk rock dog a punk rock dog The rock and roll animals The rock and roll animals Gene Vincent is a real cat cat My mum says that the spring is in the air And everyone's at it They're at it like rabbits The tall ones, the small ones, the short ones the furry ones at it like rabbits, they're at it like rabbits, no matter how ugly or hairy they are. Well, I was born here, I don't remember, but the Surrey Delta, you're in my blood. Blood, blood, I'm blooded like the fox. Magic land, this Walton on town. Rock and roll. A rock and roll.